family and friends of our graduates, I'm very proud to present the class of 2013 from the Humanities Division of UCLA's College of Letters and Science. Ladies and gentlemen, the official party. It's now my privilege to introduce UCLA's Dean of Humanities, Professor David Skaberg. Dean Skaberg is a scholar of ancient Chinese, Greek, and Latin literature. Since coming to UCLA in 1996, he has published an award-winning book and numerous articles on early Chinese historical writing, literature, philosophy, and oratory. Most recently, he has completed a translation with two collaborators of China's first great historical work, the Zhuo Zhuan. He has served as co-director of the Center for Chinese Studies and chair of the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures, and received the UCLA Staff Assembly Faculty Staff Partnership Award in 2011. Please join me in welcoming Dean David Skaberg. Before I introduce our speaker for today, I'd like to say just a few words about what you, our graduates in the humanities, have accomplished and what you have prepared yourselves for. One way to think about what you've done is to imagine yourselves as haunted. I mean, look around you. Uh, it's at commencement time that we show how frankly medieval we are in some of the things we do. On stage with me, you see men and women in medieval garb. It's not exactly a uniform, since in our different colors and our, our hoods and our funny hats, we're actually representing the different institutions where we took our PhDs, and where with those PhDs we earned the privilege of teaching students like you. We're certainly haunted by the long traditions of scholarship that brought us to this point. And we're sitting in a most medieval space, the ceremonial center of this campus, a building that recalls both the founding of UCLA nearly a century ago and UCLA's ties to medieval Italy and the founding of universities there a thousand years ago. I trust that you will return to Royce Hall many times during your lives, whether to help keep alive the traditions of performing arts that flourish here or to receive a more advanced degree or perhaps someday to sit on the stage in your own medieval outfit. Students, humanists, you're haunted, and you chose it for yourselves just as we did. You are yet another generation who couldn't help listening to voices from the other side, to the thoughts that our most distant ancestors and our most distant contemporaries have committed to writing, to the music and the art that they just had to make. And every one of you has been troubled by some question of understanding that legacy. Why does language work the way it does? What truths are we capable of knowing? What did those distant people mean? If you've ever loved a work of art or a work of literature, if you've ever pondered over a quest of interpretation, then you're a humanist and you're haunted. And this is a form of philanthropy, our kind of philanthropy, something we share. We give ourselves over to be haunted by the spirits of the past and by the spirits of people who are very different from us. We represent them and we let them speak to us in their longing way and we try to speak for them as well. But this is hardly the time to be gloomy about it. There are some serious advantages to being haunted in this way. You've taught yourselves the languages of the world and now you're capable not only of understanding your distant counterparts, but also of speaking for them, and in some cases, to them. You know much about the world and its past, and you can turn that knowledge to your advantage in any of a myriad of ways. 
You've trained yourselves in interpretation and critique and qualitative analysis, arts that any number of careers and any number of employers will demand and reward. Because you've spent so much time haunted by the literature and the arts, you're smart and you're cultured and you've learned the standards of superior written and spoken communication. You're excellent negotiators. Many of you will be excellent leaders. You have a perspective on human aspiration that makes you versatile, inventive, and adaptable. Finally, you're protectors of the human. In a time when the most reliable sort of Hollywood blockbuster, whether it's Terminator back in the day, or Oblivion more recently, or any zombie movie you care to mention, in a time when any of these seems to feature the human race on the brink of destruction, whether by self-aware computers, or by omnipotent aliens, or the dead, or whoever they may be, you've trained yourselves as defenders of what it means to be human. You're in a position to understand the predicament we're in, since in my own research, I'm a China scholar, I really can't resist repeating a line that I shared also with last year's graduates. It's from Zhuangzi, uh, the great Taoist philosopher who probably lived in the fourth or third century BCE. He worried about the way that we can lose ourselves and our own humanity in the midst of our technical and institutional inventions. He worried about how we can become dehumanized as we invent more and more things around us. And he urged us, always, and forgive me now for going into Chinese for a moment, he urged us always to wu wu, or wu wu yu wu. That is, to treat things as things and never to be made a thing among things. Keep for yourselves the human position. Treat things as things, never become a thing among things. What he demanded of us is that we remember, whether in the midst of material comfort or technological advance, or in poverty and deprivation, that as human beings, we are the free arbiters of value. We humanize this world of ours, and we do it by listening to each other and listening to the past. So, whether you're headed next for graduate school, or for a year abroad, or for the world of work, or for a time of creative endeavor on your own, you go forth from UCLA with a special ability to be haunted by other human voices, to hear, to understand, to speak, and to humanize. I'm pleased now to introduce our keynote speaker, Catherine Glynn Benkheim. A distinguished alumna of the art history department, Catherine is an accomplished scholar, lecturer, and independent curator in the field of South Asian art. She's the author of many scholarly publications, beginning more than 40 years ago with her work on painting from the Punjab Hills of Northern India, and continuing to this day with work on the painting collections of the royal families in Rajasthan. Catherine is currently working on future exhibitions with curators at the Art Institute of Chicago and the Cleveland Museum of Art. In addition to her professional endeavors, Catherine also serves on the board of the American Friends of the Israel Museum and is an emerita member of the Board of Trustees of the Freer Sackler Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. She's an advisory board member of the UCLA William Andrews Clark Library and serves on the Los Angeles County Museum of, of Art, Ancient Arts Council, and South Asian Art Council, and the American Committee for South Asian Art. Catherine received a bachelor's degree from UC Santa Barbara, a master's degree from UCLA, and a doctorate from USC. We believe strongly in driving. <laughs> as, as you can see from the costumes, we, we take knowledge where we can get it. We're an eclectic bunch. <laughs> A proud Bruin and alumna of the humanities, <laughs> Catherine has enlightened our students with her knowledge of art history by teaching undergraduates and graduate courses at UCLA. She's also taught courses at Cal State Long Beach and at Northwestern University. I'm honored and delighted that Catherine has joined us again today for this momentous occasion. Please join me in welcoming Catherine Glynn Benkheim. Thank you, Dean Skaberg, trustees, distinguished faculty, families, friends, and especially you, who 
the graduating class of 2013. It was an honor to be asked to speak to you, the humanities graduate. In fact, it was more than an honor, it was a great surprise. So why did they ask Catherine Glenn Benkeim to come back and speak to you about some lessons for life? Okay, I'm a UCLA supporter. I very am happy to support the William Andrews Clark Memorial Library where chamber music can be heard on the West Coast in a building that was built in 1926. We have so many people that want to come to our concerts that we have to establish a lottery to fill the 100 seats. And contributions, like mine, have kept the price of a ticket a reasonable, very reasonable $25. And I love coming to the Fowler and to here to Royce Hall, the Hammer and the Billy Wilder uh, Theater are also big favorites of mine. And they all contribute to the um, life, the cultural life of Los Angeles. After I graduated, I never forgot how important UCLA was to my own love of art and in particular, to the wonderful life I have had after getting my master's here at UCLA. Now, what would a commencement speech be without lessons for life? So the title of this talk is My Lives and Lessons. Lesson number one, you cannot pick your parents, you cannot pick where or when you entered this world. So lesson number one is, you cannot control everything. I was born in Los Angeles and grew up in Studio City. So I'm one of the original Valley Girls. <laughs> if I hadn't been born here, I might not have gone to UCLA. Who knows? Lesson two, there are things you can control if you have enough persistence. Even though I hadn't majored in art history as an undergraduate, I wanted to go on in the field. So I went to the chairman of the art history department at UCLA and asked to be accepted to school. He said he would give me a trial period before accepting me. I decided to give him a trial period as well. <laughs> he taught South Asian art. I took his course. I got accepted. I studied. I graduated, I went on. There are doors that seem closed that you can open with really hard work, again, persistence, and there are some things you can control if you really want to. Lesson number three. So all that schooling that we've done, that I've done and you're now finishing, and some of you are gonna go on to do even more. Lesson number three is that the fundamentals, the reading, writing, arithmetic, I know arithmetic has to be changed to a digital age word that, but you get it, you get what I'm talking about. Reading, writing, and arithmetic are the keys to your future. Can you read critically and analytically? Can you write persuasively? These are the things that I would want to know if I were in a position to be hiring you for anything. And I hope that's what your professors have been doing with and for you. For if so, then you can be proud, as I am, to have received your degree today from UCLA. Lesson number four, sex. Good, I've got your attention. <laughs> well, actually, we're not gonna go into a lot of depth about sex. We're going to move right along to lesson number five. <laughs> lesson number five is to be ready to take advantage of new opportunities when you can and be open for when they happen. For take it from me, they will happen. 
When I was a beginning graduate student here at UCLA, I went to a cocktail reception for the new curator of South Asian art at the LA County Museum of Art. He offered, and I took a job working in the curatorial department at LACMA. I got married, and my husband was a collector of Persian and Indian paintings. So I became a collector of Persian and Indian paintings. And I love, love, love collecting. Collections are now the focus of my life. After LACMA, I was offered a job to open up the Los Angeles chapter of the American Friends of the Israel Museum. So I did development. And because of my background, if a donor wanted to offer us art instead of money, I was in the perfect position to analyze that art, if it, see if it had a secondary value, and accept it for the museum or reject it. The Israel Museum in Jerusalem is one of the great encyclopedic museums of the world, and I was very lucky to be a part of it. I taught classes at universities when they needed a non-Western course. All along, I kept publishing in a scholarly manner, using my maiden name, Catherine Glynn, my UCLA name. And you know what I still love best? When a young colleague comes to me and asks for help so that I can give back. So, lesson number five is that you will probably have way more jobs, way more professions, way more professional opportunities than you can imagine right now. Take advantage of the opportunities when they come along. Lesson six. Change happens. The world has expanded. Communication has exploded. Friends have moved away. Friends have moved back. And sadly, friends have died. Borders of countries that I thought were fixed aren't even on maps any longer. GPS trackers show us exactly how to find the nearest coffee shop and they're probably showing a drone in the sky right now where we are here in Royce Hall at UCLA. On the one hand, we know so much more. On the other, we know exactly how much we're never going to know. Fields of study that we thought were complete have been turned upside down. Sculptures and paintings in museums turn out to have been stolen or looted from their countries of origin, or taken from families escaping death during war, and now have to be returned. Perhaps the greatest album of paintings from the Mughal dynasty, made for one of the great Mughal emperors in India, now rests in Tehran, in Iran, a country that didn't even exist when the Mughal ateliers created these dazzling paintings. And these paintings won't be coming to the United States for you to see, because various countries share more antagonisms than they do community. In fact, when some of the albums left Tehran to go to an exhibition in Switzerland, I hopped on a plane and went for four days and spent time looking at them with my magnifying glass and marveling. But that's a lecture for another day. Change happens. After 25 years of marriage, my husband died in 2001. Seven years later, I remarried to my now partner, a wonderful, intelligent, smart, and attractive woman. Who knew? Thank you. Thank you, California. Thank all of you that believe in marriage equality. Change happens. And if you are ready and courageous, and you've learned all the other lessons, 
you will be able to recognize it, go with it, take advantage of it, change yourselves. Risky business, these lives of ours. Yes, change happens. And if you're as fortunate as I have been, the past will be one of the key tools for your future. Starting in 1970, I made trip after trip after trip all over the world. And everywhere I went, I photographed art objects. So I have zillions and zillions of slides. And there are a few of us of my vintage that have extensive slide collections of our work in South Asia. And we're trying to put those online so that they're available to you, because you should have them too. One of the values of spending a long time learning art history is that we have all of these images. So, when a museum is looted in Afghanistan, for entrance, instance, it is the art historian who was there who has photos and can tell you what is missing now. It is the art historian that can call up an auction house and tell them that a piece that they are offering was in fact stolen. It is the art historian who has the image in her mind when a dealer sends a JPEG of a painting that she wants to sell, that that painting was hanging on the wall of a museum in Kashmir in 1976. But that is a story that will not be told at another lecture. That is something that the prudent art historian just uses as an example of the value of learning over time. Lesson seven and eight and nine. Who knows? I have a future ahead of me and I am sure that at the end of that time, I will, have, will know what lesson seven eight, and nine are. In the meantime, it's time for you to learn your own lessons. Thank you for letting me share mine. Be generous with yours. Your pursuit of a degree in the humanities means that you're going to be contributing to a more humane world. Oh, and remember how I started a few minutes ago with my own contribution back to UCLA for my passions, be assured they're all going to ask you to contribute back for your passions. Say yes when you can. Congratulations to you all.